Hello, and welcome to week three of our webinar series, Introduction to Remote Sensing of Harmful Algal Blooms. This week's session is Understanding Hands in the Coastal Environment. My name is Sherry Palacios, and my co-trainer is Amita Mehta, and we are delighted that you are joining us for another week in this series. We are really excited to have our guest speaker, Dr. Clarissa Anderson, with us today to talk about her HAD forecasting tool, CHARM. She will be presenting about a halfway through this session. Just a few reminders on the course structure. The meeting days are Tuesdays, and the times are at 11 Eastern and 2100 Eastern. A question and answer period will follow this session. Please use the chat feature of the software to write and submit your questions. My email will be provided in this chat window if you'd like to email questions afterwards. You can access all the course materials on the RSET website. Each week, you will be able to find a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in both English and Spanish. The Spanish version may be available at a later date, a link to view the recording of each week's webinar, and the PDF of each homework assignment and a link to the Google form for homework submission. Please note that in order to view the webinar recordings, you must register. This helps us keep track of who's viewing them once you register, you'll be automatically taken to the recording. We will have two homework assignments. You've already been given one after week two, and then there will be another one after week four. These will be submitted through Google Forms, and they're due October 1st for the first homework assignment and October 15th for the second one. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all four live webinars and complete both homework assignments by the due date. It does take some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. So why take this course? The objective of the course is to provide an overview of satellite Earth observation resources, data, and tools available for HAB applications. And by the end of the course, you should be able to identify NASA's Earth Science Remote Sensing Data Products for the identification and monitoring of HABs, and we covered that mostly in week two. To describe how coupled remote sensing and modeling approaches are used in decision support tools, and that'll be the focus of this week and next week. And to use some Earth Science data tools to monitor for HABs, we'll be covering that for most of the weeks. Here's the course outline, and this week we're gonna be talking about HABs in the coastal environment. This week's objective is to describe how coupled remote sensing and modeling approaches are used in decision support tools in the coastal marine environment. First, we'll review some material from weeks one and two, and then I will present information on how remote sensing observations can be used to identify algal blooms using some case studies. And then <clears throat> I will use the two case studies of coupled remote sensing and modeling approaches to identify and forecast harmful algal events. Following my overview section, our guest speaker, Dr. Clarissa Anderson, will talk about the HAB forecasting tool she developed for Coastal California that uses a coupled remote sensing and modeling approach. After her presentation, we'll open up the time for short question and answer period. So let's get started. In week one, we provided a description for what is a harmful algal bloom. Harmful algal blooms, or HABs, occur when colonies of algae simple plants that live in the sea and fresh water grow out of control and produce toxic or harmful effects on people, fish, shellfish, marine mammals, and birds. The human illnesses caused by HADS, though rare, can be debilitating or even fatal. We also discussed ways in which algal blooms can be harmful, including when they produce toxins, cause economic losses, contaminate drinking water, smother benthic organisms, deplete oxygen causing hypoxic zones, impede visual predators, and attenuate light to benthic organisms. We also noted that while all of these are ways that HABs can be harmful, it is the toxin-producing HABs that often cause a more urgent response by natural resource managers. Responses include shutting down drinking water supplies and closing fisheries so the toxins do not vector through the food web and harm human health. We discussed 
what some of the causes of HABs may be. As mentioned earlier, phytoplankton growth is often driven by light, nutrients, and temperature. Perturbations in these abiotic factors, as well as in other factors, can lead to harmful algal blooms. These include nutrient loading or eutrophication, pollution, warm water events, food web changes such as the loss of a key grazer in a system, introduced species, changes in water flow from events like hurricanes, drought, or floods, and also yet unknown factors. The worldwide distribution of HAB toxins is wide-ranging and has increased over time. In recent times, nearly all coastal regions have been afflicted with toxic HABs, often by more than one toxin or species, and over large geographic ranges. These maps of HAB toxin incidents are from 2016 and demonstrate this wide geographic range and presence of multiple toxins in some locations. It is important to note that remote sensing imagery is a tool to aid in the monitoring and forecasting of HAB events to understand impacts to the ecosystem and or human health. Remote sensing imagery does not replace sampling on the ground. Imagery with associated algorithms and ecosystem models inform, informs adaptive sampling approaches used by resource managers. So how can remote sensing be used as a tool for decision support? In today's presentation, we will approach this topic from the perspective of coastal marine HABs. We have reviewed some of the parameters or data products we use in identifying algal blooms and for use in harmful algal bloom forecasting systems. These include chlorophyll A concentration, the chlorophyll A anomaly, taxon-specific bio-optical properties, and sea surface temperature, which can be used on its own and also as a proxy for other environmental parameters, such as nutrients. In week one, I mentioned that we would be talking about a few of the harmful algal forecasting systems currently in use. The HAB Bulletin, led by Dr. Richard Stump at the U.S.'s National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, has been a groundbreaking approach to using coupled remote sensing and geophysical models to forecast landfall of HAB events in different places around the United States. One of these places is in the Gulf of Mexico. The bulletin is more than just a forecasting tool. It is also the successful platform for communicating HAB events to a region that depends on the sea for recreation and commercial activities. The dominant HAB species on the West Florida shelf is the dinoflagellate Karenia brevis. This organism harms the environment and human health by causing hypoxia, neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, and when the toxin and cell parts are lofted into the atmosphere, these blooms can cause severe respiratory distress for people on shore. For people who suffer from asthma, these airborne toxic events can be quite hazardous. So as a result of this, there's a strong community support for the HAD Bulletin. The HAD Bulletin uses chlorophyll A concentration, the chlorophyll A anomaly, and the inherent optical properties of Karenia brevis in its forecasting system. What is the chlorophyll A anomaly? For this HAB bulletin, it is the daily chlorophyll A concentration minus the bimonthly mean of chlorophyll concentration, as you see here in the middle, or the average of chlorophyll over 60 days leading up to two weeks prior to the daily value. Why this two-week lag? The two-week lag produces the likelihood that the persistent and stationary bloom will bias the mean. The two-month period was chosen because it's, because it's long enough to have sufficient images to describe the seasonal patterns, but short enough to present a single seasonal pattern. A chlorophyll anomaly of greater than one milligram per meter cubed is considered to be indicative of Karenia brevis bloom. If you would like more information about the algorithm, I encourage you to follow the link at the bottom of this slide or to look up the citation. You can find that citation under the question and answer period of question 18 from week one. Chlorophyll concentration gives an estimate of phytoplankton biomass. Chlorophyll A concentration alone without prior knowledge of the system is difficult to use as a metric for a bloom. In the right-hand panel here, you see an example of the chlorophyll A concentration. This is along the 
east coast of the U.S. and also the region around the Florida and the um, West Florida Shelf. So if you know something about the system and you know the amount of chlorophyll that's typically in the water at background concentration, then you have an, can have an idea or familiarity with the system so that you know if there's an increase that it indicates a bloom. So for example, where I live, when the non-bloom chlorophyll concentrations range about two to five milligrams meter per meter cubed. When an algal bloom occurs in my area, which is on the west coast of the US, this value can rise above 50. Even a concentration as low as 10 to 15 milligrams per meter cube is still considered a bloom in my region. Even at the seemingly low concentration, we can sometimes have toxic organisms in the water. The water discoloration may not appear extreme. In autumn, where I live, when we get our red tides, chlorophyll concentration can rise above 150 milligrams per meter cubed, and the water looks like orange soda pop or red velvet chocolate cake when the surface foams are present. Can the chlorophyll concentration alone, like you see in this image here, tell us if it's a harmful bloom? No, it can't. This is where the chlorophyll A anomaly can provide some benefit. It is a change detection tool, a way to observe how different the present condition is relative to some climatological mean. This approach can be used in a variety of water types and is not just in this example shown here in the Florida region. So let's say you are interested in monitoring for algal blooms in a water body of interest near you. Trying this chlorophyll A anomaly approach may be a good one to use in a pilot study of your region. Before using it for decision support, however, it would be necessary to evaluate if the sensor being used is appropriate, if the chlorophyll concentration and anomalies being estimated are accurate compared to in-water measurements, after such a, and then to validate the model. After such a validation, then this approach may be appropriate and the skills needed to develop and implement this process flow are within reach for most beginning and intermediate remote sensing imagery users. If you are interested in trying a chlorophyll anomaly approach using daily data you obtain yourself, we recommend looking into NASA's Ocean Color Web managed by the Ocean Biology Processing Group to learn more about accessing data and processing it with the freely available image processing software called CDAS. There are web tutorials for CDAS. Amita talked about these tools last week in the week two session. The chlorophyll A anomaly is an effective tool when one blooming forming bloom forming species dominates. It provides a rapid assessment of an increase in phytoplankton biomass. It can be easily computed by beginning users of remote sensing imagery, and it is agnostic to region, meaning it could be an effective tool for assessing algal blooms in almost any aquatic environment. As I said, in week two, Dr. Amita Mehta introduced you to several data portals and web tools to access aquatic remote sensing data products. Two tools were mentioned that permit the user to easily obtain chlorophyll concentration data over time. One tool is through the West Coast node of NOAA's CoastWatch. This node provides the user an entry point to NOAA's ERDAP data server where it is possible to access global data at daily, eight-day average, or monthly averages. The other tool, NASA's Giovanni, also permits easy access to a time series analysis. The current chlorophyll, chlorophyll data sets are limited to monthly averages, though. In week two, you learned how to access the Giovanni tool. For a time series, on this page that you see here, what you'd want to do is click on the fourth plot type which is for a time series analysis, as you see highlighted in yellow. There are several options under this um, choice uh, for a type of time series. The one I typically use is the area averaged time series. Select the date range over which you wish to see this time series. And then to the right of that, select the region to provide a bounding box for the area average you will see in the time series. Choose a variable, in this case, it's the monthly four kilometer modus aqua chlorophyll A concentration. After making these selections, 
click on the green plot data button to query the Giovanni database to produce your time series. This can take some time, so be patient. I often find getting a cup of coffee is a good time span to wait. Giovanni enables the user to access the Earth observation data without the overhead of needing to learn image processing. From the previous query, a time series appears of monthly mean chlorophyll in the region of interest. In this case, the region of interest is shown on the map or on the image on the right. <clears throat> That's an awfully large area for an area average. The time series plot is to the left of this image. When we focus just on the area offshore of St. Petersburg where you see the star, we see the effect of the periodic blooms that we get in this region of the, red, um, the Florida red tide. Through Giovanni, it is possible to download these monthly data and calculate the chlorophyll A anomaly. I'd just like to emphasize that this Giovanni example we've given is for illustrative purposes only. If you were building your own monitoring tool, you would need higher temporal resolution data than the monthly averages provided for Gio by Giovanni. Like I said, the NOAA ERDAS tool serves data at a higher temporal resolution. Again, if you're planning to build your own monitoring tool, <clears throat> we urge caution in verifying that you are using the best sensor for your system that has the radiometric, temporal, spatial, and spectral resolution that you need and that you validate the remote sensing data with in situ measurements and that you validate and provide skill assessment for any predictive models that you develop. Some algae have unique optical properties that can be used to differentiate them from the background phytoplankton biomass. For example, we have already talked about Karenia brevis. This dinoflagellate is relatively large and has low backscattering in the green and blue parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Relative to other phytoplankton groups found in its region, researchers have observed this difference and have taken advantage of these low backscattering um, values and used it to improve forecasting models developed for the Gulf of Mexico HAD bulletin. On the right, microcystis is a cyanobacterium that contains gas-filled vesicles that cause it to float to the surface, forming a green scum. Because this green scum is emergent from the water and does not have a layer of light absorbing water above it, the scum strongly reflects light in the near infrared. This characteristic can be exploited in environments where no other vegetation is emergent from the surface. Microcystis and other phycocyanin containing cyanobacteria can also be discriminated using phycocyanin specific algorithms that we discussed during the question and answer period of week one. You can find further citations for those algorithms in the question and answer document on the course web page. For most of this webinar series, we have focused on ocean color measurements in the visible range and very little on sea surface temperature or SST retrievals in the thermal range. Remember that the primary abiotic drivers for algal growth are light, temperature, and nutrients. Studies have shown that many harmful algal species, especially the cyanobacteria, like warmer water temperatures. SST observations can be used in forecasting models to identify habitable, habitable water for HADs. Water temperature has long been a proxy for other environmental parameters in the world of phys physical oceanography. And those relationships can be exploited in remote sensing observations of SST. Satellite observations of SST can be used in regional oceanographic models to estimate nutrients such as nitrate and silicate, which are so important for algal growth and in particular for silica for diatom growth. The value of SST observations mustn't be overlooked in developing HAB observation and forecasting systems. So what are some examples of HAB forecasting systems that use remote sensing observations? 
We have already talked about the Florida red tide organism, Karenia brevis, that produces the toxin known as brevitoxin. This organism affects the health of humans and animals in the region. As noted earlier, it can cause hypoxia, neurotoxic shellfish poisoning if it gets into the food system, and respiratory distress in people when the airborne toxin drifts over land. Blooms are patchy, and so the impact is varied by location and time of day, depending on where the bloom patch is located, how dense it is, how the ocean currents are moving in along shore, what kind of wave action or surf conditions are present, and the effect of wind speed and direction on the advection or horizontal movement of the bloom towards or away from the shore. Blooms of this organism occur in different regions of the Gulf of Mexico, not just Florida, and because of the harm they cause, NOAA and partners developed the Gulf of Mexico Harmful Algal Bloom Bulletin. And here's an example of a blue bulletin report on the lower left. The NOAA HAB Operational Forecast System produces the HAB Bulletin. The forecast developed for the bulletin uses an analysis of ocean color satellite imagery, models, in situ observations by field teams, public health reports, buoy data, and forecasts derived from the fluid dynamics models of that region to predict Karenia brevis bloom transport, intensification, and associated respiratory irritation based on the forecasted intensity and landfall from the models. A person can subscribe to the HAB bulletin, which includes workers in public health, natural resources, and scientific fields. A week after the bulletin is sent out via email, it is made available to the public on the website. The frequency of these bulletins depends on the location in the Gulf of Mexico and if there is an ongoing HAB event. <clears throat> in southwest Florida, it is once per week during non-HAB periods and twice per week during HAB events. I encourage you to follow the links below the image if you'd like more in-depth um, description of the bulletin and also the user guide of the details that go into the models for the bulletin. There you'll see a link to the guide. In the guide they go into more depth on how they use chlorophyll concentration, chlorophyll A anomaly, and the Karenia brevis specific optical properties in a combined or ensemble approach to pinpoint which regions are most likely to be blooms dominated by Karenia brevis, and if not Karenia brevis, if it's a bloom of something else, and also to give an idea of where landfall is most likely to occur. As mentioned in week one, another HAB organism implicated in food web vectoring is the dinoflagellate from the genus Alexandrium. These images on the right show Alexandrium catenella. This genus produces the potent neurotoxic name saxitoxin, and it causes paralytic shellfish poisoning, which can be life-threatening. <clears throat> the Gulf of Maine experiences toxic Alexandrium fundiens blooms that are harmful to the ecosystem and human health. The U.S.'s NOAA National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, again under the guidance of Dr. Richard Stump, has taken the lead in developing the harmful algal bloom monitoring system for different regions around the U.S., including the Gulf of Maine. This system delivers near real-time satellite data relevant to harmful algae for these different groups. The system also serves an experimental forecasting model for the Gulf of Maine and near real-time communiques similar to the HAB bulletin just described for the Gulf of Mexico. The forecast was developed to minimize the impact of blooms to public health and the local economy. Researchers observed over time that there was a correlation between the overwintering resting stage, or cysts, of Alexandrum fundiens and the distribution and abundance of blooms the following year. So where they saw cyst beds the following year, there was a higher likelihood of having a bloom in that environment. This real-time, now-cast forecast simulation that you see on the left incorporates this overwinter cyst information to initialize or seed the model each year. This forecast model is complex and for the physical, cir physical circulation components it includes a three-dimensional simulation of ocean circulation, tides, winds, heat flux, daily river discharge, sea surface temperature, and boundary conditions. 
for the biology component of the model, or Alexandria Fundian's components, it includes population dynamics, cyst maps from the previous autumn, daily solar radiation, monthly climatological nutrients, and an empirical mortality rate related to temperature. It is important to note that this is an experimental product that is still undergoing validation and skill assessment. As it is refined, it will be a powerful tool for fishers, resource managers, and the public. Skill assessment is an objective measurement of how well the model now cast or forecast guidance does when compared to observations. It is a key component for building forecast systems and no decision support system should be used without the rigorous effort it takes to do this. Without skill assessment, it is not possible to know if the forecast is accurate and to with what, within what uncertainty. It provides decision makers with the probability of a forecast being true. And to help us understand the value of skill assessment of a forecasting system, it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Clarissa Anderson. Dr. Anderson is the Executive Director of the Southern California Coastal Ocean Observing System, and we're really excited to have her here with us today. Okay, I'm going to hand it off to you, Dr. Anderson. Hello there. My name is Clarissa Anderson. I'm a biological oceanographer. I work primarily on topics concerning harmful algae. But as director of the Southern California Coastal Ocean Observing System, based at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, I'm also managing a network of coastal ocean observing instruments, as well as models. And these serve a wide variety of stakeholders and user groups in California. So it's really exciting to get this chance to tell you today about um, one of these models, and that is the California Harmful Algae Risk Mapping System that I co-developed with a large team of people. You can see some of them here in the list on this slide. Um, and it does take a village to create such a thing, and it takes many years. And I hope I can impart how uh, the journey that we've been on over the course of this talk. So to start, I'll give you an overview of what we'll cover today. Um, First, it's really important to understand the needs of the user community, community that really motivated model development. Um, I'll walk you through a very abridged version of how we developed the model over many years, followed by our demonstration platform to distribute this model routinely, to create routine output that ensures that this model, the CHARM system, meets community needs. And then I'll also end with a brief dissection of how a model becomes a federally quote unquote operational tool. And this process is often referred to as crossing the valley of death because of the many pitfalls associated with turning a research product into a reliable management tool. You'll see the crossing of valley of death phrase a lot in industry as well because when you take a product into mass marketing or mass production, um, there are a lot of, of hurdles one must, must overcome to make that a sustainable operation. So as I said, I'm going to start with why we would want to predict harmful algal blooms in California. Um, it's really important to understand some of the background here about the organism of interest. Uh, the production of the neurotoxin demoic acid by this diatom pseudonychia is really the one major and recurring harmful algal bloom issue on the West Coast. Uh, pseudonychia is a diatom. It's a type of phytoplankton. It's a unique one because it's the only genus of diatoms that produces some sort of compound that we would consider toxigenic. Uh, most other harmful algal blooms are caused by flagellates, uh, usually dinoflagellates. And those are often referred to as red tides, despite the fact that they can discolor the water a variety of colors. As pseudonychia blooms frequently occur in coastal California under a set of somewhat understood conditions. Uh, you'll see in this talk that there are certain conditions we understand. Um, does it mean we understand them perfectly? No. But we do have a sense of when this organism will produce a nasty compound called demoic acid. It's basically an amino acid that really highly resembles glutamate or glutamic acid, and this is what makes it a potent neurotoxin. 
we've now had two consecutive years of unprecedented demilic acid levels on the West Coast, and particularly in California. The most notorious was the 2015 bloom that spanned from Santa Barbara to Alaska and shut down the $100 million crab fishery, Dungeness crab in particular, in California. Um, it affected these fisheries um, in the Pacific Northwest as well and led to widespread marine mortality, marine mammal mortality. We can see the picture here of the sea lions. We've um, seen an incredible number of what are often termed unusual mortality events where large numbers of not only sea lions but, but Guadalupe surf, fur seals and other kinds of highly protected mammals come to shore either highly distressed or already dead and, and then they often are euthanized in captivity. Um, sea lions do strand annually in response to offshore demotic acid events but these, these last couple of years have been historic. So what do we need to do? Well, I have something here where I'm referring to the initial baseline. Um, managers from a variety of sectors, particularly shellfish growers, have expressed interest in an early warning system, and that will help them mitigate losses, or at least hopefully help them mitigate losses, when demoic acid contaminates their products and makes them unsafe for human consumption. Um, humans acquire what's called amnesic shellfish poisoning when they eat shellfish that's been contaminated with demoic acid. Uh, and that is a big safety concern. So if we were to move ahead to try to create a tool that will help managers, any model or any kind of a tool would need to do better or provide some kind of added value above and beyond the baseline for decision making, which right now is sampling by the California Department of Public Health. And they monitor for demoic acid, but really only when the organism Pseudonychia is present and in high quantities and tends to, this tends to really rely on a fixed quarantine period. Um, this does a good job of keeping people safe from illness and in 2015 they heavily increased their sampling to deal with the crab closure. But it really doesn't tell us what's happening offshore or give any kind of early warning of harmful algal blooms um, that would allow a decision maker or a manager to act quickly and decisively um, as, a, as an event is starting offshore or even near shore. So this is what we set out to do. And I'm going to give you a little sneak preview. This is kind of the, the punchline. Uh, before I get into the sausage making, I thought it would be fun to give you uh, the end result so you could see where we're going. Uh, this way you have a visual of where we're headed. And as you see here, we've got some animations of toxins. This is the particulate demoic acid now cast and forecast. This is for 2015. These illustrate what are the routine predictions from that year that we were putting out routinely for, for the dangerous levels or the, or the risk of dangerous levels of demoic acid. So the next section at the top I'm going to describe how we made these maps. Um, what are the building blocks that led to this kind of um, display that you see here? In the beginning, well, okay, maybe not that back, far, back that far, but let's start in around 2006. If I can draw your attention to the green circle on the right of the Venn diagram, this refers to when uh, a book chapter by Bloom and colleagues was published to show how one could take cultures of, of the diatom pseudonychia that were manipulated into producing demoic acid and then connect that toxin production in a statistical way back to the ambient conditions both in the lab and in the field. And that's what you're seeing here in the green circle. Um, in red on the left is my attempt at something similar using field data collected monthly from around 2004 to 2006 in the Santa Barbara Channel. And this time we used optical data to, which is, were incorporated by using a radiometer in addition to also measuring all of the coincident water properties that we could measure such as nutrients, temperature, salinity, chlorophyll, and of course, the, most importantly, the amount of demoic acid and pseudonychia in the water at seven locations every month. And that dynamic range you get from a time series like that really helps to create a robust statistical model. And then in the blue, in this diagram, you're seeing work by Lane and colleagues that links pseudonychia blooms, this time in Monterey Bay, to environmental conditions such as upwelling, temperature, nutrients, as well as river discharge. The take-home message from this slide is that there's a number of overlapping conditions where these circles intersect, and that is represented by a common set of predictors for these blooms. 
uh, and for when toxins might be present. So it's not just the bloom that we're interested in. You can have Pseudonychia in the water and not have domoic acid. So we really have to understand when will we have this toxin present. And interestingly, in all four of these studies, the concentration or the amount of what is called silicic acid and nitrate are important. So these are two very important macronutrients. All diatoms need silica, silicon to create their microscopic shell bodies. You may have heard the word frustule before. Um, that's what, what we call these little shells that the diatoms form. Um, nitrate is necessary for all phytoplankton. So all phytoplankton, all algae that grow in the ocean are going to require nitrate. They don't all require silicon or silicic acid. This is important here because the domoic acid molecule contains nitrogen. So if you're going to have that molecule produced, you're going to have to have some nitrogen in the water. Uh, so now that you've seen the, the kinds of environmental conditions that best correlate with blooms and also with domoic acid from field samples, in California and elsewhere. We can start to think about how these might be incorporated into some kind of a numerical equation or an algorithm that would compute the probability of having such an event. When are we going to have a harmful algal bloom, a bloom of Pseudonychia, or a significant event of domoic acid? And if you use a rigorous method of evaluating those parameters in, in what we call a stepwise manner, you end up with equations like the ones that you see here. And they incorporate various ratios of remote sensing reflectance at various wave bands. That's what you would get when you, you know, point your satellite sensor at the water and you get your water leaving radiance coming off the water. We compute those into remote sensing reflectances. In this case, we were doing it from a handheld radiometer or a radiometer that we then deployed on an instrument and put in the water. As well as we looked at temperature and salinity, as I said before. And I really want to draw your attention here to the red circles because those are the nutrients that we recorded. And here you're seeing nutrient parameters for particular domoic acid as well as Pseudonychia and then something called cellular domoic acid, which is what the CDA refers to. So for the second equation, the particulate domoic acid equation, the ratio of silicic acid to nitrate is the second most important predictor of high particulate domoic acid. And not only that, it's low silicic acid relative to nitrate that really matters. This equates to a potentially stressful environment for the diatom of interest. I told you that Pseudonychia and all diatoms require silicon from their environment through silicic acid. So if it is low relative to nitrate, that may indicate that that is somehow a stressful environment and may be some kind of an insight into why the organism is starting to produce a strange compound that it is producing in high quantities. And we do link this back to some kind of physiological stress. But because we can't get at these powerful nutrient variables that you're seeing in these equations in any remote or kind of real-time way, we decided to focus on models that eliminate that nutrient component. And you might ask, why, I mean, why would you do that? You get a lot of information from the nutrients from the f understanding the physiology. And the reason for this is we need to come up with a method that allows us to predict these blooms or detect these blooms um, quickly. And if we can't get the nutrient data quickly, do we also have statistical power to do this in a way that only relies on the things we can get remotely or from space or from a model? So then what you're seeing here um, is what you get with, when you have three algorithms that eliminate those nutrients. Uh, there's a big reliance on variables that we can get from the ocean color sensors in space and variables like chlorophyll, those are variables like chlorophyll and remote sensing reflectance. And then of course other physical variables, I mentioned temperature and salinity, those can be simulated by models. Um, of course temperature can also be acquired at very high accuracy from satellites, but we chose to take temperature and salinity from a forecasting model of the circulation of the ocean. And you're seeing that up in the upper left hand side of the slide where it says regional ocean model system or ROMS. And this model is a lot like a weather forecast in the ocean. We then take ocean color estimates from sensors like MODIS on Aqua or VIRS on SUMI NPP. And when you merge all of these things together, you have everything you need to compute those equations and generate some very interesting spatial maps of the risk of blooms or the risk of domoic acid. To deal with the fact that there are clouds in most of the daily satellite images from NASA, we apply an open source program called Dyn EOF. You see it here, Data Interpolating Empirical Orthogonal Functions. This helps us fill in the gaps in the imagery. 
um, we, you know, I won't go into too much detail here about how, how it works, but it's, just think of it as a statistical method that allows you to interpolate across those gaps. And I wanted to make you aware of it and show you that it can be applied to predicting biology, not just the physics in the ocean. Right here is a little animation of applying it to physics. This is to a reconstruction of daily sea surface temperatures. And you can see on the right how well those matched up with buoy data of temperature. And this next slide is a similar demonstration, but this time applying it to the biological fields. Here we've gone ahead and computed the algorithm for Pseudonychia and then applied DynEOF to these five-day intervals. And what you're seeing on the right is what it looks like to match up those data extracted from one pixel with the data from a pier in Santa Barbara where we were taking cell count data of Pseudonychia weekly. And so this is the 2009 Hindcast showing you how well those matched up in time. And it was a pretty nice correspondence for that year. So as we did a lot of this demonstration, we then moved ahead to put all of these pieces together and do this in a, in a routine fashion. And this very, I guess, seemingly complex slide is just showing you everything I've already shown you in terms of the building blocks, but linking it together in a stepwise process so that you can see how we are creating the tool that we create routinely. Um, first, you've got the one kilometer modus imagery that's set what we call sub to get the regional area of interest. Um, Gaps from the clouds and the other poor quality pixels are filled statistically with that DynEOF routine. We can do things like generate error estimates for those variables. Uh, for instance, remote sensing reflectance at bands that we require. There's some additional tuning that we perform. And then, like I said, we mix all this up, merge the fields with the hydrodynamic model, that circulation model that gives us temperature, salinity, currents. This is all downscaled to um, a three kilometer model. And now what we've got is all the ingredients we need to compute our harmful algal bloom and domoic acid algorithms. So we predict the likelihood of Pseudonychia blooms and domoic acid. We create now casts. That means what's happening right now. But we can also create a forecast. And here in green is something called an infection scheme. This allows us to say, what does the circulation model tell us about currents in the next three days? And now can we push the biological fields forward in time for three days and see where they will be? And this allows us to create a three-day forecast. And so all of these things are published online. We also have a crowdsourcing component. I don't have a lot of time to get into that today. But I'll point out that there's been a lot of developments here um, for crowdsourcing, everything from trying to put out um, uh, like a cellular phone, smartphone attachment for a microscope that citizen scientists can help us record the abundance of the organism. We also work closely with uh, marine mammal stranding networks like the Marine Mammal Center and look at them for real-time data because as the marine lions, the sea lions are, are stranding out in the ocean, we are finding that this is a really nice sentinel to tell us when we're having an offshore event. And if we can validate our model with respect to those incoming strandings, that's very helpful. So these maps go out daily onto a website hosted by CENCUS. That's the Central and Northern California Coast Ocean Observing System. And they've been a major partner in this work since about 2014. Uh, these are the latest conditions that you see here on the left. We have also look at the, we show you the the latest conditions for all three variables, as well as the forecasted conditions and the previous conditions. Um, there's a portal where you can look at previous conditions uh, from all the from going back to when we started putting these maps out routinely. And then I have here the circles a little bit offset from the black box, but the black box says user survey, and this helps us address the concerns or improve the way we display the maps and communicate with the public and with managers. So we want to address people's concerns as to what's happening when there's a harmful algal bloom event and have a sort of a two-way street for discourse. But we also want to have a method of bringing in comments from managers and people who are using these models to understand how we can improve our displays and our visualizations. So that data portal that I just mentioned is a really nice tool for going back in time and for zooming in and out interactively or even downloading data from, say, a time series from a given region or a given pixel. So this, you can see that there's a, um, a time bar on the bottom that allows you to scroll backwards and forwards in time and look at these, um, these maps, these images that 
give you a nice sense of the variability of these blooms over time. So I think this is a really nice tool both for, for policy or for decision makers who need to know what just happened in the last week. I know that the marine mammal folks are highly interested in connecting the strandings that they have to the conditions a week or two weeks prior, and this has given them a tool to do that. All right, so going back to that sneak preview slide from the very beginning of the talk, uh, you can see here that these are the same animations on the top of the pa top panel. But on the bottom of the slide are 2016 maps with a, a new kind of color bar. So from the survey, from the stakeholder survey that I pointed out a minute ago, we know that the color bar used in the top maps was not very easily interpreted by fishermen and other members of the public. So we've adapted a simpler scheme for illustrating the risk of HABs and the risk of toxin exposure. Um, we bend the probabilities into three group or four groups, low, medium, high, and very high. Of course, it's a little bit subjective where we decided those cutoffs should be, but this has, I think, helped interpret when you've got only four colors to make a quick assessment of what should be done or where a region might be highest at highest risk. So another welcome outcome of the survey are these testimonials that we get from people who stand to benefit the most from having this kind of a predictive model like CHARM. Um, Bernard Friedman here at the top is the owner of Santa Barbara Mariculture. It's a grower, a major grower actually for California of mussels. And, and because the model only resolves three kilometers at a time, uh, we've had issues meeting all the needs of, of this someone who's growing shellfish and they are doing this very close to shore. So you can imagine that a, a model that resolves at three kilometers would make that challenging. Nevertheless, shellfish growers do see some utility in having another tool in their arsenal when it comes to planning. And that's what Bernard Friedman is expressing here in this testimonial. So where Sea Harm has actually proven really valuable is with helping marine mammal re rescue and rehabilitation centers. You can see that the people leading those efforts are pretty grateful for this resource, um, particularly because sea lions are the canaries in the coal mine when blooms start offshore. I mentioned that they're considered sentinel species. This is because um, we can't always detect a bloom at piers or shore stations as it's forming. That tends to happen later, or it's just disconnected from what's happening offshore. And that decoupling leads to some challenges for the marine mammal community as to understanding when they might start to see strandings and that they can um, rally their resources accordingly. So the Seahorn model, model has pr provided this missing spatial picture of risk in offshore waters that I think was highly needed. Um, and then there's the fishing community and boaters that also use the tool, and they express their gratitude via the survey. Uh, water quality concerns for many people um, are important, people who recreate frequently or make their livelihoods from the ocean. So in 2015, there was a major bloom connected with very warm waters. Um, this is called the Pacific Warm Anomaly. This is all throughout the Pacific. And you may have heard of this as, as it has been known in the media for quite some time as the blob. There were many impacts. Uh, one of the most widely discussed and important was the Dungeness crab closure. So the Dungeness crab fishery closed in California, um, as well as other parts of the Pacific Northwest. But in California, it closed for at least five months. Animals were also stranding along the entire west coast of North America. So there were huge economic losses to the, the, the crab fishing community on the order of $60 million. And there were huge losses in the ecosystem with respect to uh, marine mammal mortality and, and other effects that we may not have, have even measured at this point. And what I'm showing you on the right are the routine products, the sort of previous conditions I referred to earlier of Pseudonychia blooms and domoic acid at the time of the bloom. It was hard to really get a sense of how well the model was doing because so much of this offshore extent is not measured routinely through our peer sampling programs. But this bloom was extensively sampled via a cruise of opportunity as part of the um, Northwest Fisheries Science Center and Southwest Fisheries Science Center, both putting out um, extensive resources to monitor fish abundance and fish larvae for stock assessment, but we use this as a, as a cruise of opportunity to get harmful algal bloom measurements. And this gave us this rare chance to do the kind of offshore validation that a model like this requires. And you're seeing on the right, um, well, what's on the left is the cruise, but what is on the right 
is the map of pixels pulled out for each of these sampling stations. Um, what I want to draw your attention to is on the left is the amazing density of this bloom. You can see the water was colored dark brown, as you can see in that jar, and then just below that is a microscopic image of how many Pseudonychia are in the water. It looks like a monospecific bloom, like only Pseudonychia is there. Pseudonychia are these needle, almost pencil-like uh, diatoms that form long chains, and you're seeing just a, a mess of chains in that water. So it's a challenge to even count with light microscopy to get a sense of the sheer numbers out there. But as they conducted this cruise from June to September along the entire West Coast, what you're seeing are, is the variability over that time period of how much Pseudonychia was out there. And then on the right is the model. And what we did see was, was pretty good accuracy. Um, a couple of interesting things. Trinidad is a new hot spot. Um, we have been knowing a lot, we've been learning a lot about Humboldt County and how important that is uh, for these blooms. And um, we capture that here in the model. Uh, there are high abundances around point conception that's captured here, but there's also some overestimation of the bloom likelihood outside of San Francisco Bay, which has been a slight problem with the model. And then um, just at the bottom, what you'll see is that we didn't see the bloom in Southern California. This was a really interesting feature of this event, which really marked geographically the region from Santa Barbara to Alaska, as I mentioned before, but did not occur, occur south of Point Conception or south of Santa Barbara Channel, I should say. And for domoic acid, there's some underestimation along that, that Trinidad region. So we're doing the same thing here for domoic acid. There's a spatial offset in the model versus observations offshore San Francisco Bay. But overall, we had 71% accuracy. Um, there was a slight overestimation in the Southern California bite where we didn't see any domoic acid, but I think overall we're capturing that variability very nicely as you move from south to north. And suddenly in 2017, that situation was completely inverted. We went from, from having a bloom from Santa Barbara to Alaska to having pretty much nothing happening in that northern region, but only Southern California was seeing a major harmful algal bloom event. And this was in the spring, months of this year. And this slide illustrates the way that this uh, sea harm system was capturing that kind of spatial variability. Um, there's a big box <clears throat> at the bottom, which is showing around April 15th, the onset of the harmful algal bloom as an offshore event. There were low toxins measured at the piers at that point, but animals were already starting to strand in large numbers. And on the right is around May 17th when that harmful algal bloom was moving south and north, but also um, becoming a very near shore event. There were more impacts felt near San Diego. The HAB was becoming a big problem in Santa Barbara Channel where many birds were, were dying and stranding. We had sea lions, elephant seals, fur seals, um, many birds that I've listed here, including the California brown pelican. There were also shellfish advisories in Santa Barbara and Ventura County. And um, as a result of a lot of the sampling that we do and this model work, we were able to alert the California Department of Public Health that there was such a big issue in LA County where measuring or collecting for shellfish toxins is not as quite as routine. And so that was stepped up and led to another closure in this region down in Southern California. So this slide is, uh, looks a little tricky at first to, to understand, but this gets us into this validation that I've been discussing and how, as a manager, you might want to apply various thresholds or understand what it means to take a model like this and make any kind of an alert. Um, you would need some kind of a tool where you could decide for yourself when to act on a given harmful algal bloom event based on a sliding scale of alert levels. Um, so if you wanted to say increase how many false negatives there are, but minimize the number of false positives, you could use something like this. These, these acronyms in the legend are really just to, meant to illustrate things like that FAR, which is false alarm rate, or POFD, which is the probability of false detection. And these are the kinds of things that you could shift around and you could understand the cost benefit. This plot shows you what that cost benefit would be of, of moving your, say, a 60% probability or a 50% probability around. If you wanted to be um, very conservative and you wanted to say that at a 50% probability that there's a domoic acid event, you should start to inform your, your um, either your employees or, or whatever resource it is that you're managing and you're trying to 
um, inform the public about that, you may then need to know if you're using such a conservative threshold, what that means for how accurate the model is at that threshold. And this is what's called an adaptable modeling approach. And so we've, we've done this, it's published, and we will be putting this out as part of the bulletin and part of the tool in the near future. So now I'm kind of getting into a little bit more of the validation for shellfish. We, we, we've seen that there's some good connection to when marine mammals strand, and what's actually measured in the water. But what does sea harm tell us about shellfish toxicity? And I already mentioned that it's tricky to predict shellfish toxicity. Uh, shellfish growers are, are having a hard time always linking the model directly back to their product. Uh, so to get a better handle on this, we're beefing up our partnership with aquaculture. Um, for instance, Coast Seafoods, which is in Humboldt County and is the biggest, I think, national producer of oysters and Catalina Sea Ranch, the first federally funded offshore aquaculture site um, in, in federal waters, which is down here in Southern California, and along with scientists at Humboldt State University and a private engineering firm. Of course, it always takes a large group. We're trying to, to link the, the, the model, the sea harm system, statistically to what is happening with shellfish. So we want to find this statistical relationship between the in-water properties that the model is giving us a sense of what's that risk in the water, and then really link that to the risk in the shellfish. And this will help us create a shellfish sub-model that we can publish simultaneously with our bulletin that um, will hopefully allow shellfish growers to directly interpret this model in terms of what it means for their product and for their shellfish. So very quickly, let's revisit the earlier slide that shows you that path towards making the model federally operational. Um, there's a lot of acronyms here. This is what, what we get into when we start to bring something like this into the world of NOAA, where there are so many different line offices and so many different groups operating. Um, and it's important to understand that even though um, this is ocean work, there's a link to other groups within NOAA like the Weather Service because that is where a lot of the high-performance computing resides for creating large models of both climate and weather. And we would be taking advantage of the, some of the same computational platforms to move something like this into routine operations. And the takeaway you really hear is that moving all of this from Sencus, where we run it routinely now, to NOAA um, requires this kind of computational infrastructure to run the model daily and make it routine so that it will run 24-7 along with all the other harmful algal bloom models around the country. So I've got some of these things circled here just to under, so you can understand how we've been moving forward with migrating this stuff over. And ultimately, it will um, cohabitate the same space as these bulletins that are going to be going out for all of these different regions. Some of them are already operational, like the Gulf of Mexico. Some are, are, are and Lake Erie, and some are close. I, I should have updated this because Lake Erie has just come online um, as being operational. But some of these others are definitely in queue to be next, like the Harmful Algal Bloom Bulletin for Sudnichi in the Pacific Northwest. And we will be moving in that direction pretty fairly soon. So I'd like to end today by highlighting the ways in which this approach is being applied to other regions to see if it could work for Sudnichia blooms outside of California. I explained earlier in the talk that we developed this model and have continued to develop this model and tune this model from data primarily collected in the Santa Barbara Channel. So we're already surprised that we do as well as we do for all of California, but to then extend the reach of this to some region that is so far removed from um, the same upwelling system is, is interesting and is an interesting exercise. So um, what you're seeing here is that there was an attempt to do this in Argentina because after some significant mass mortality events of southern right whales in Peninsula, Peninsula Valdez, Argentina, a lot of attention was drawn to the problem that this region was seeing with these, these very rare animals washing ashore seemingly in response to harmful algal blooms and they were laden with toxins like domoic acid. So a team of NASA developed students applied the sea harm model, those algorithms, and made probability maps that you're seeing here on the right. And these corresponded pretty well with some of the stranding events and matched those. They then matched those to the HAB monitoring data to see if they could make some comparisons. 
So the correspondence was successful and that gave them first place in the summer's project competition in that year. And we don't know if this is a, a robust relationship that would hold up over time, but it's really interesting to see that the relationships that we've established between environmental conditions and these blooms in California um, may be holding up outside of the region where that model was developed. So it would be nice to do more exercises like this. There is a student um, working on something like this for the Gulf of Mexico, and there may be other opportunities. So this is an opportunity to engage um, the management community because we may be able to um, work on applying this to other regions where student achievement is now an emerging problem, for instance, on the east coast of the United States where we're now seeing a recurring problem of student achievement and demoic acid just over the last couple of years. So these things don't seem to be going away, and I think that developing tools like this is going to be um, an ongoing struggle for us in the community to make sure that we can, we can help um, mitigate the losses and impacts of these pretty extreme events. So I will end there and thank you for your time. Um, thank ARCIT for this opportunity to share the CHARM model with the community. And of course, all of our funding agencies that have, have brought so much attention and support to creating something like this, which really took about 10 years to do. We had early support from Ocean Protection Council and Sea Grant, as well as, of course, the NOAA NCOS programs, MERHAB and ECOHAB through C-Score which have really laid the, 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 the building blocks for the, the physiological understanding of the organism that we have that allowed us to create such a modeling platform. And then most recently, NASA Applied Sciences, as well as OBB and Energy and Water, have been incredibly helpful in getting us uh, to create a routine product that brings in all of the satellite data that we need and then takes this to this next operational level that I think was crucial for the public. And so as you've seen, there's ways to apply this to other regions. And if you were interested in doing that, we are working on making those scripts open to the public. Um, as we transition this model to NOAA and start to create a bulletin that goes out to the public through NOAA, we will have a, um, a toolbox at the ready of all of the scripts that we have used to create this. But of course, there was a lot of data that went into the building the algorithms, and those are um, regional algorithms. If you wanted to recreate those, you certainly could do that with your own um, field sampling. But if you didn't want to do that and you just wanted to apply what we've already done to your region to see how well it works, uh, we will have that, that sort of a setup at the ready. Everything will be open source. So please keep your attention to NOAA as these bulletins start to come online, and, um, and hopefully that will be of use to you, and, and I will certainly take questions on this at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, for your presentation on CHARM. Today, we have talked about remote sensing as a tool for decision support, how remote sensing and geophysical models can be combined to understand a system and build a forecasting method for that system. We've talked about uncertainty estimates and skill assessment with respect to HAB forecasting systems. As with a weather forecast, decision makers need a sense of confidence for how they communicate risk to the public, and skill assessment of forecasting models plays a role in that. Finally, our guest speaker, Dr. Clarissa Anderson, provided an overview of the decision support tool she has developed for the U.S. West Coast named CHARM. Thank you so much for your participation in this week's session. We hope you learned some new information about what it might take to build a HAB forecasting system. Next week, we will be focusing on cyanobacterial blooms in freshwater systems as we discuss large-scale monitoring using remote sensing and citizen science. In a few moments, we will begin the question and answer period. Please remember that if we cannot get to your question this week during the session, I will be posting answers to the, most of the questions to the webinar series webpage in a few days' time. Thank you. Um, question five, I actually am not familiar with quorum chemical sensing. Do you know what that is, Clarissa? Have you, are you familiar with this? Yeah, there's some new sensors out there um, for doing this, but in kind of um, multiple small sensors out at once, creating a, and using certain 
um, I think it's a bit of, of machine learning that goes into the algorithms for computing what that chemical signal would look like. Um, for the aerosol sensors, that, that may very well be um, something that would be interesting. I don't think we've done it so much in the ocean that I could give it an answer on how well that would work. We're, we're actually working right now on developing some very small sensors for dissolved amylic acid that would go on to smaller robotics and even gliders and AUVs, and that might give us this, this possibility of having a lot of sensors out at once that can give us a very good spatial sense of where something like dimoic acid is in the subsurface. And I'm not sure if that quite answers the question, but that's, that would be my best answer. Okay, thanks. Question six asks, how do we get chlorophyll data for coasts and lakes of Guatemala to process them in GIS? And we talked a little bit about this last, actually quite a bit about this last week and week two and how to access the data. Um, this person does go on to ask a few more questions about how they might be able to use it to detect demoic acid in the Pacific and Atlantic waters of Guatemala. And it seems like, Clarissa, your work um, applying it to Argentina seems to be pretty successful and might be worthwhile to look into these other regions. What do you think? Yes, um, there, yeah, you, certainly we've been trying to apply this to other regions. I, I, I can't really say yet how successful um, something like a model that really was tuned for California is going to be for these other regions, but mm -hmm. optical images that you can use to detect demoic acid, you know, specifically in this question, if that's just the reflectance fields from um, a satellite sensor, there's no reason you can't apply them to your region. It's just going to probably require a bit of um, training and understanding of how well that applies to the in situ measures of demoic acid if you have those. Okay. And you, I think, said in your presentation that you're going to have the code available for and more detail on how to use CHARM. Could that be used elsewhere with, of course, these rigorous tests and skill assessment for whatever region they would apply it to? Yes, yes, that's the idea. It, it'll probably still be about months to a year out before we um, were ready to put those out into the public domain as we transfer this tool over to NOAA. We have a few things on, on a semi-public website right now, but I feel like it will be helpful for us to annotate our scripts and routines better before we put them out there. But of course, that's, that's the end goal, that people should be able to apply these or you know, tweak them themselves. Okay, great. Um, I'm just scrolling through some of these to make sure that we get to some of the sea harm questions while we still have you. Uh, question number 13, um, it asks, uh, what are the limitations of sea harm? Well, uh, one of the limitations comes down to the spatial resolution of the model. It's a three kilometer model. It's very hard to resolve the near shore, um, the very sort of inner shelf which is a region where you would imagine it's very important to resolve for harmful algae. When it comes to the shellfish growers, I think I explained this a little bit when I was talking about how we try to serve the needs of our, one of our key stakeholder communities, which is the shellfish and aquaculture community. And I, I think we, we fall short in that a bit because we cannot tell them from, from one shellfish growing site to another, it is hard for us to resolve what is happening at that granular scale. When it comes to the offshore dynamics, we do a lot better because we are capturing that large scale flow and that definitely pertains to things like marine mammals and more ecosystem level effects. But if we want to know on the kilometer by kilometer scale on the near shore, it's a bit trickier and that will change as technology changes. If we have uh, models that have a, a higher resolution um, satellite sensors with a higher resolution and even a higher spectral resolution, we'll start to be able to improve that our abilities with respect to all HAB models. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking up at question 11, and um, you're, I think the CRHARM model is really interesting, and um, I, I would be curious to know what more has been done with other models out there to detect other toxins. Um, if you could impart some of your knowledge of other systems that have been put into place for toxins. Uh, so in, in, in Lake Erie, the detection um, algorithms are really more on the optical side of things, typically for the organism itself, for microcystis and, and changes in chlorophyll biomass. I'm actually not aware of toxin models, per se, that are being used routinely and where there have been a number of exercises in the academic literature to come up with various mechanistic models, even for demoic acid implementing them has been very different. Uh, I don't 
know of any that are being implemented. Most of the time, the models are really looking at the organism and predicting when the biomass of, say, Karenia brevis or Alexandrium will increase. So the Pacific Northwest uh, Bulletin does try to give a predictive sense of the shellfish toxicity, but it's not quite done in quite the same way as our model. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm reaching down. I think it's going to be question 17 now. And um, we have a large uh, international audience. And um, one of the drawbacks, I admit, for uh, this had webinar series is I've, had, I've needed to focus a lot on US models that exist. Um, and so uh, because that's where my familiarity is, but also um, just because I think that there is a limited amount of work that's been done globally on HAD monitoring. Um, but this person is asking, are the, is there information about harmful algal blooms in Nigeria? Are you familiar with any other HAD forecasting models outside of the US that you might be able to point some folks to? And this person is from Nigeria, so um, maybe in Africa. Yeah, there's work going on around the world. Um, I don't have any good knowledge for Nigeria, nor for Saudi waters. I see the question about referring to Saudi. And mm -hmm. I would say, uh, you know, the UK has been working very hard to develop um, a number of systems throughout, uh, or actually the EU, I should say, throughout the whole European Union. There are a number of harmful algae systems going in, into operations. And Again, they're going to be a similar situation. We're applying something for, say, the waters in, um, off of France is going to be a very different situation than in Nigeria or Saudi. And what it will come down to is you can take these platforms and apply them to your region, but in the end, you will probably have to rely on a certain amount of sampling in your region to kind of ground truth and, and understand the dynamics of the harmful algae where you are, what species and toxins that you're dealing with. But I'm not aware, I'm really not aware of any data in those areas, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump back up to question seven because it's of interest to me, and that is, um, and I'm going to ask for your input on it. I can provide some input. Are there known linkage, linkages between HABs and air pollution and any particular sources of concern? And on this question, I wonder, is the HAB the source of the air pollution, or is air pollution having an impact on the production of HABs? And we've talked a little bit um, about, and even in this session, about Karenia brevis and how it can produce um, when it um, wave action can cause it to loft into the atmosphere and be uh, a problem for respiratory um, issues for people on shore. So as a, as a source of air pollution, I'm more familiar with it. But Dr. Anderson, I'm wondering if you can provide more information on both as a source and as possibly how air pollution may have an impact, um, if there's any knowledge in that area. If you don't mind um, giving us some of your expertise on that too, please. Yeah, my answer, my initial answer would be very similar to yours, that Karenia brevis is the, one of those few exceptions where we know there's a, a clear impact on the air quality. Uh, the research in the other direction um, is, is much more scant. There's a lot of work, I think, going into the idea of urban areas and nitrogen deposition from urban regions into water, waterways. I, I can think specifically of work in areas like the Chesapeake Bay where they thought about this nitrogen deposition and its influence on, on the algal communities, in part because you have nitrogen fixers that might respond positively to these sorts of um, N2 deposition. But I don't know of the direct influence of that on harmful algal bloom species. And that is, that is an area of research that's not been explored. Mm -hmm. All right. So Dr. Anderson, is there anything else that you'd like to tell our audience before we wrap it up today? Well, I was just thinking about the air quality, too, and not only Karenia brevis, but there's a lot more work now on microcystis and the aerosolized component of microcystin toxin, and I know that there's an explosion of research on that in the Great Lakes region, just to be aware of. Um, that's, um, I think, an, uh, an overlooked factor of these blooms to the communities that live along the water. Uh, but yeah, other than that, no, I, I don't really have much more to contribute. Um, it was, it's been very fun being a part of this. Well, we really appreciate the time that you took to give us your presentation and to stay on for these questions and answers. Um, I'd like to remind our audience that any of the questions that we didn't get to today will post online for next week, and they'll be available on the course website. And we thank you for your participation, and we look forward to having you back next week when we will be 
primarily focused on cyanobacterial blooms, talking about large-scale monitoring and citizen science efforts. So thank you very much, and we will see you next week. Bye.